Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Fairley, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about making computer games with Ruby. A little bit before uh, I get started, though, I'm going to tell you about my employer. I work at Braintree Payments, and we make it possible for businesses of any size to easily take payments online. We work with thousands of really awesome merchants, including some of these that you probably recognize, and we'd love to work with you, too. So if you have any payment-related questions, please come find me later. I'm assuming that most people in here are web developers, that the Ruby you get paid to write is part of a Rails app or a Sinatra app, and the libraries you work on, intend, uh, you intend to end up inside of a web application or to be used to test a web application. And I'm in the same camp. As long as I've been doing Ruby professionally, I've mostly been working on Rails applications. Um, but computer games are what got me into programming as a kid. And even though I have sort of given up on my professional aspirations of doing that, um, there's still something that uh, I've been exploring as a hobby and something I do sort of nights and weekends and I have a lot of fun with. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what game, program game programming is in the abstract, uh, show you some of the tools we have in Ruby for doing game programming, take you uh, through a brief demo of building a game up from scratch, and then leave you with some pointers uh, for next steps to take if you found this interesting. But first I have to answer the question, is Ruby really the right tool for doing game development? Isn't Ruby slow, and don't games need to be fast and not have long GC pauses in them? And yes, but uh, most of the Ruby libraries are actually wrappers around C libraries that are quite fast. And if you don't believe me, I have a small existence proof here of a pure Ruby Minecraft clone I've been working on. Um, this is 800 lines of Ruby, and it's plenty fast. And so if that's possible, then just about anything uh, you want to, to make is possible. And obviously the next... Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty won't be written in Ruby, but if you just want to have some fun, Ruby's a great tool for doing it. So at a very high level, almost every game has uh, what's called the game loop at its core. Um, the game does a little bit of initialization at the beginning just to get uh, the state of the game set up. And then as long as the game is running, it repeatedly updates the state of the game world based on player input or timing. Uh, and then it takes this state and renders it out onto the screen so that your human player can see it. And I'm going to dive into each of these uh, steps in a little more detail. So the setup is where you get, thing, where you get the game ready to go. Um, and while you're prototyping, you'll probably just hard code some Ruby uh, and you know, construct some classes directly and assign them to instance variables. But as your game grows and you have different levels or different maps, you'll probably want to load um, your, your setup code from some sort of external file format where you've declared uh, what sort of items and enemies to place in the game and what the, the map layout looks like. And once you let your players save their games, you'll need to be able to serialize the game out and then load it back up later in a different instance of the game. And these are all different forms of setup. The update part of the loop is where the real meat of the game happens. It's where you, all of your game logic lives. Um, it's where the player interactions and timing and all sorts of other things come into, come into play. So I'm going to show you a couple different things that you can be doing during the update portion, portion of the loop. Uh, so one of the biggest factors that comes into play is the previous state of your game. So in a world with gravity, um, every, every tick through the loop, you'd probably update the player's position based on some sort of vertical velocity they have, and then also change that vertical velocity with some sort of gravitational effects. And so here, the new state of the game is uh, deterministically derived from the previous state of the game. User input uh, is also a huge factor of um, taking actions during the update step. So here, maybe your user uh, presses A, and that causes their character to jump. Timing. Uh, is also uh, something that you use during the game loop to cause things to happen. So if you have a fire-breathing turtle that's supposed to spit a fireball every two seconds, every time through the game loop you can check and say, is the last time I spat fire more than two seconds ago? If so, spit fire. And that will give you a nice fireball coming out every two seconds. And most games also have some sort of random component to them. So if our Italian plumber hero uh, pot hits a block and a random item is supposed to come out of it, we might randomly pick 
uh, among possible outfits that could pop out of the top of it for him to wear. And finally, the rendering is uh, how you're, you're, the human playing your game actually gets to see what's going on. Um, in a simple 2D game, you'd probably have something like this, where you just draw a bunch of images to fixed locations on the screen that are based on uh, some of the current state. But you could also draw text or 3D models or um, simpler shapes. And what's important to note is that the render method doesn't modify the state of the game at all. Um, you can call it over and over again, and you should always get the same image out of it uh, without modifying the state at all. So we have an awesome tool in, library, in Ruby for making mostly simple 2D games called Gosu. Uh, and Gosu in its entirety is about 105 methods. So you can master it in almost a weekend. And I'm going to give you a brief tour of Gosu right now. At the core of Gosu is the Gosu window class. You're expected to subclass it and implement three methods on it, initialize, update, and draw. And you'll notice that these are the three methods from the game loop. Here, setup is called initialize and render is called draw. But Gosu handles all of the, the hard work of getting the window to show up and managing the timing of the game loop. And you're just responsible for implementing your actual game logic in these three methods. And Gosu also provides a bunch of helpers for actually implementing uh, parts of these methods. So Gosu has a bunch of drawing helpers. Um, a commonly used one is draw quad, where you pass it four points com consisting of an X, a Y coordinate, and a color. And it draws a quadrilateral on the screen. And there's also draw triangle and draw line. Similarly, uh, you can construct an image with the window you're going to end up drawing it onto and a file name of, say, a PNG file, and just draw that uh, image out to a given point on the, the screen. And you can also construct a font with the name of the font and a size and render text out onto the screen. Gosu also makes getting input from your player pretty easy. Uh, so the button down method will return true if a given button is being held down, whether it's a button on the keyboard, a mouse, or a gamepad or joystick. Uh, and if you have mouse interaction in your game, you can both set and read the positions of the mouse through mouse X and mouse Y. Sounds are pretty, simple, uh, pretty similar to images. Uh, you can construct a sample with a window and a file name of a sound file. And then every time you call play, um, the sound will come out of your speakers. And then Gosu also includes some math helpers for a lot of 2D geometry you'll find yourself doing while making 2D games. So offset x and offset y, um, if you travel distance units across angle, it'll tell you how much of that traveling was on the x-axis versus the y-axis. And Gosu distance will give you the distance between two points. I've written a library called Hasu that makes uh, rapid iteration on Gosu games possible. And it does this in a couple of ways. The main one is hot code loading. Um, so normally with Gosu, if you're playing your game and you see something that you want to change, even after you change the code, you have to exit the game, start it back up again, and play again until you get to the point where you can see your change take effect. With Hasu, uh, it watches all of your Ruby files. And as you change them, it reloads them into your running game. And you'll see the effect on the next cycle through the loop. Similarly, uh, if you cause an exception in your Gosu game, it crashes out, and you have to fix it, then start the game back up, find your way back to where you were when you caused the exception, and make sure it doesn't happen again. Gosu, uh, Hasu, on the other hand, will catch your exceptions, pause your game, and then after you've fixed them, uh, resume the game and let you keep playing right from where you left off. And because Gosu does its initialization, uh, it does its setup in its initialize method, you only get one shot at it because you're only constructing the window once. Um, Hasu, on the other hand, lets you define your initialization in a reset method that you can call at any time by pressing the R key, letting you uh, iterate on your setup as well. And with that, I've shown you probably a solid quarter of Gosu's API and told you a little bit about Hasu. So now I'm going to show you how to stick all the pieces together and make a complete game. And we're going to do a, a pseudo live coding demo of building Pong from scratch. And I say pseudo because most of the typing is pre-recorded, so you don't have to watch me make egregious typos or get lost or get stuck in some funny Emacs mode. So we'll start off by installing Hasu, which will also install Gosu. 
And we'll put our code in pung.rb. And our pung class is going to subclass hasu window. And I'll give it a width and a height that are about 75% of this screen. And in our constructor, we're going to have to call up to Gosu's constructor to give it the size of our window and the fact that we don't want it to be full screen. And at the bottom of the file, I'll run this class. In a new tab, I can run that file, and we end up with a blank window. So it's time to get something showing up here, and I'm going to start with the ball. So for Hasu co hot code loading, you have to use hasu.load instead of require. And in our setup, we'll just construct a ball and assign it to the instance variable. And in the draw method, we can tell the, draw, the ball to draw itself onto the window. And our ball is going to start out being pretty simple. It's going to have two attributes, x and y, that represent the center of the ball. And they'll default to the center of the window. And for drawing, I'll use the draw quad method that I showed you back during the slides. Here, x1 is going to be the left edge of the window, y1 of, of the ball, y1 will be the top, x2 will be the right side of the ball, and y2 will be the bottom. And we'll define those in just a few seconds. And we'll use the uh, gosu red constant uh, for the color of the ball. So the left edge of the ball is just going to be the horizontal center of the ball minus half its size, which we have to define. And x2 and y1 and y2 uh, are all pretty similar. They're just half the ball size offset from their center. And after we reset, we have a ball on the screen. And it's a little small, so I'm going to bump the size up. And as soon as we tabbed back, uh, the, larger, the new code was taking effect, and we see the larger ball. And it's time to make this move. So we'll add the update method to our window. And each update will just tell the ball to move itself. And so the ball is going to need an angle and a speed. And I'll default the angle to up and to the right and the speed be four pixels per, per tick. And the move method will be pretty simple. We'll use the offset x and offset y that we saw earlier to calculate deltas for uh, the x and the y position. And then we can add those deltas to the actual x and y position, and that'll give us our movement. And it's a little slow, so I'm going to bump the speed up just a little bit. And this is cool, except that the ball is moving off the top edge of the screen. So let's make it bounce. At the bottom of the move method, we'll check and see if we've just moved the ball off the top edge of the window. We should move it back down, and then flip the Y component of the ball's angle to give us a natural bounce. And same thing for when the ball is headed towards the bottom of the screen. We'll check if the ball's moved off the bottom of the screen. And if it has, we'll nudge it back up to where it belongs. And again, flip the Y component of its angle. And I'm going to extract out this flipping of the Y component of the angle into a new method called bounce off edge. Um, this dries up our code a little bit, but it would also be a great place to hook in a sound effect. And it looks like we don't have access to dx and dy in this method, so we'll need to pull them out of move into their own methods. And they'll prove useful as we move on.
And so it looks like the refactoring worked. Um, it's a little boring that the ball is headed in the same direction each time the game starts. So I'm going to randomize it just a little bit. These numbers will cause it to start somewhere in a cone facing to the right, um, so it never is moving straight up or straight down. And then half the time, I'll also flip it so that it heads to the left. Okay, so now we need to do something about the fact that the ball is flying off the, the left and right edge of the screen. And in Pong, uh, the left player and the right player will each have a score, and any time they hit the ball across their opponent's line, uh, they get a new point and the game starts over. So back in our reset method, we'll start off each player with a score of zero. And we'll construct a font object that we can use to draw these scores onto the screen. And we'll draw the left player score in the top left corner of the window. And we'll put the right player score in the top right corner. And then each time through the update method, we can ask the ball if it's moved off the left edge of the screen. And if it has, we should increment the right player score and reset the ball. And if the ball's moved off the right side, we should give the left player a point. And so I'm going to pause here for a little bit and point out something about my development workflow when I'm doing games. Um, you'll notice I'm not writing tests like you normally would in a Rails application. But I am writing my code outside in, and I still get this outside in feedback like I would while doing outside in TDD. Um, so here, this exception is telling me that I haven't defined off left, and then that's the next thing to do. So off left and off right are incredibly straightforward. Basically, <laughs> is the left edge of the ball hanging off the left edge of the window? Or is the right edge of the ball hanging off the right edge of the window? And now we have uh, the score going up every time the ball crosses uh, the opposite side of the screen, which is exactly what we want. But it's a little mean to give these players scores when they don't really have much control over the course of the game. So we need some paddles. Unsurprisingly, the paddle code will go in paddle.rb. And we'll start the game with, with two paddles, uh, one on the left. And another on the right. And like we did with the ball, we'll tell the paddles to draw themselves onto the screen. And the paddle will have two attributes, its side and its vertical center. And we'll use the side that was passed in. And like the ball, the paddles will start off centered in the window. And I'm going to cheat here and copy the ball's draw method, because this is actually a generic rectangle drawing method. Um, but if we had more time, we could extract this out into a common superclass or a mixin that both paddle and ball would use. And so the left edge of the, the, of the paddle is actually going to depend on which side of the screen it's on. So the left paddle's left edge is going to be flush against the left edge of the window. And the right paddle's left edge is going to be the right edge of the window minus the paddle's width. And I'll give paddle a width, a width and a height that I think look pretty decent. And the right edge of the paddle is just going to be the left edge plus its width. And like the ball, the top will be its center minus half its height. And the bottom will be the top plus the, width, the height. And we reset and have some decent looking paddles. Um, and it's time to make them move. So I'm going to have the left paddle be controlled by the W and S keys on the keyboard. 
So while the W key is being held down, the left paddle will move up. And up is pretty simple. We just add, or we subtract a little bit off of Y. And whenever I hit W, the paddle will move up. And down is the same thing, but we add instead of subtract. And I'll wire the S key up to control down. And the right player will use the up and down arrows to control their paddle. And so our paddles are moving, but there's a problem. Actually, I'm going to extract out this magic number into a constant and bump it up just a little bit so that our paddles are a little zippier. But there's a small problem with the paddles' movement, and that's that they can move off the edges of the screen. Um, but this is easy enough to fix. When we're moving down, when we're moving up, uh, if the top edge of the paddle has crossed the top edge of the screen, we push the, the paddle back down to where it belongs. And if its bottom edge has crossed the bottom edge of the window, we can bump it back up. And now it's time for the real meat of the game, getting the ball and the paddles to interact. So every tick through the game, we'll ask the ball if it's intersecting the left paddle. And if it is, we'll tell it to bounce off of the left paddle. And same thing for the right paddle. And it's not important to understand exactly what this intersect method is doing right now. Just know that it's the generic formula for determining if two rectangles are overlapping. Um, I don't really have enough time to dive into the details of exactly how this works, though. And when it hits the paddle, we don't have our bounce off paddle defined yet, so that's the next task. So when the ball hits the left paddle, we'll need to move the ball a little to the right so that it's no longer overlapping the paddle or possibly hanging off the edge of the screen. And conversely, when it hits the right paddle, we'll have to move it back to the left. And then similarly to when the ball hit the top or the bottom, uh, we can flip the x component of the angle so that the ball heads back in the other direction. And this works, but it leads to a slightly boring game where the ball doesn't do much interesting. So to fix this, when the ball hits near the center of the paddle, I'm going to have it come off at a very steep angle. But when it hits towards the edges, I'll have it come off more shallow. So to do this, we can take the difference uh, of the vertical position between the ball and the paddle and divide it by the paddle's height. And this will give us a number between negative 0.5 and 0.5. And we can multiply that by 120, uh, by 120 to get us a cone, and then tilt that cone to the right. And then if we're hitting the right paddle, we actually want to flip the cone back so it's facing the left. And so now the ball's doing what we want. When it hits near the center of the paddle, it comes off in a, in a horizontal direction. But when it hits near the edges of the paddle, it comes off much more vertically. And to make things a little more interesting, we can also speed up the ball every time it hits a paddle. So after 10 or so bounces, the game actually gets pretty challenging. <laughs> and I'm a little tired of having my left hand play against my right hand.
So I'm going to build a simple AI that I can play against. So we'll have the left paddle be the AI. And so if the left paddle is the AI, then it'll control its own movement rather than letting the human control it with the keyboard. And we'll pass in a new argument to the paddle's constructor, noting that it should be con controlled by the computer. We'll add the new field and take it in in the constructor, but have it default to false so that the right player is still human controlled. And the AI movement is going to be pretty simple. If the paddle is below the ball, it should move up. Otherwise, it should move down. And after we reset and have the left paddle controlled by the AI, it works, but we get this weird sort of jittering, um, which is easy enough to fix. Oh. I jumped past that, sorry. Um, so I've shown you enough for now, but we still don't have a way to quit the game. So we can define a button down callback in the window. Um, and when the escape key is pressed, we can tell the window to close itself and end the game loop. And that was Pong in 15 minutes. So we didn't necessarily end up with the prettiest looking code, and the update method got pretty unwieldy. Um, but you saw how easy it was to notice a bug or find a feature you wanted to add and write 10 or 20 lines of code in a minute or two and build the game up from nothing. Um, I've put all of the code for this on my GitHub, and the commits uh, are roughly ordered uh, in video with the videos I just showed you. So if you want to see it get built up again, you can just follow the commits. Um, so if you found this interesting, I have a few more pointers of other things to look into. Um, and this link in the top left will, um, top right, sorry, will uh, take you to a gist that has links to everything else I'm about to talk to. So Gosu actually has uh, a decent ecosystem going on. Um, Metro, Gamebox, and Chingu are all frameworks built on top of Gosu that provide you a little more structure and help you deal with common tasks like mapping keys on the keyboard to method calls on your models or dealing with the menus or pausing. Chipmunk is a Ruby wrapper around the Chipmunk physics library. So the physics in Pong wasn't too complex, but as you start getting into gravity and having dozens or hundreds of objects all interacting, getting the math right is really hard, especially the corner cases. And the Chipmunk library has this all taken care of for you. The releasey gem makes it easy to package Ruby applications, including Gosu games, up into Windows executables or Mac apps. So you can put them online for people to download and not force them to install Ruby and RVM and a bunch of gems. Um, and Gosu also lets you drop down to sort of raw OpenGL code uh, when you're interested in learning about 3D graphics, which is exactly what I did in the Minecraft demo I showed earlier. And then Gosu also has some somewhat active forums where people are showing off games they've made and pointing to their Gosu source code and showing off tools that they've built to help them make games more quickly. So Game Programming Patterns is a freely available online book that I think is really awesome. When I started doing game programming, uh, the patterns and best practices I knew from web development didn't really translate over to help me structure my games. So Game Programming Patterns is written by a veteran of the games industry, and he talks about a lot of the common problems that games face as they grow in size. And the, what, the, what the industry has learned over the decades on how to structure those solutions and sort of the trade-offs that come into place while, while taking advantage of these patterns. And if you need an excuse to, to, to take a weekend to learn how to make a game, uh, you've got one coming up in about a month. Ludum Dare is a 48-hour game development contest. Saturday at midnight, they announce a theme, and thousands of people all over, all over the world start developing games and by Sunday night, you turn it in, and there's an online gallery of all the games that were made that weekend that all follow the same theme. And I think Gosu and Hasu are perfect tools for just trying to learn something over a weekend and finish a game from, make a game from start to finish. 
And with that, uh, thank you, and please go have some fun with Ruby. <laughs>